Now suppose we look at sensing devices used for measuring temperature. The most common sensing device used industrially is the thermocouple. The operation of the thermocouple is based on the principle that if two wires of different metals, such as iron and copper, are connected at both ends, and if the connection at one end is hotter than the other end, a difference in voltage will be created, causing a current to flow in the circuit. This voltage difference is proportional to the difference in temperature. Therefore, if you connected a voltmeter into the circuit, the difference in voltage could be measured. Since the voltage difference is proportional to the temperature difference, the meter can be calibrated in degrees and thereby used to measure temperature directly. The meter scale may look like this one, or the temperature may be recorded on a chart. A meter can have a switching arrangement to permit selecting any one of several thermocouples to measure. In this way, one instrument can be used to measure any one of dozens of temperature points. Let's look again at the thermocouple circuit. Remember, we said that the temperature difference between the hot and cold junctions was measured. Therefore, the cold junction temperature must be known before the hot junction temperature can be determined. The cold junction is usually located in the temperature instrument in the control room, where the temperature does not change very much. This makes the cold junction remain at room temperature. However, a cold junction compensator is frequently used to make automatic corrections for any variation in cold junction temperature. Also, the size of the voltage generated at a given temperature depends on the wire metals used. Most thermocouple pairs are made of iron and an alloy of copper and nickel called constantan. However, for particular cases, other alloys are used. The hot junction is called the thermocouple, and it looks like this. The wires are fused together at the end, and a ceramic insulator keeps the wires from touching, except at the end which is inserted in the process stream to be measured. To protect the thermocouple from damage, it is usually inserted in a protective well. From the outside, a thermocouple well would look like this. Looking at a cutaway, you can see the measuring junction where the two wires are welded together. Only the measuring junction is exposed. The rest of the thermocouple wiring is in insulators. The terminal head of a thermocouple assembly provides the tie-ins for connecting the thermocouple wires proper to the extension wires that lead to the instrument. Since these extension or lead wires are part of the thermoelectric circuit. They must be of the same, or have very nearly the same, thermoelectrical properties as the thermocouple wires. In many cases, extension wires of the same material as the thermocouple are used. However, where the extension lines are very long and the thermocouple wire very expensive, other materials may be used. For example, where an expensive platinum rhodium thermocouple is used, the extension wires may be a copper nickel alloy. Another temperature sensing device is the bimetallic strip. If strips of metal, which have different thermal coefficients of expansion, are fastened securely to each other and then subjected to an increased temperature, the assembly will curve in the direction of the lower thermal expansion metal. This device, called a bimetallic strip, is the basis for most thermostat instruments. One thermostat that you are familiar with is the one in the radiator of your car. Its job is to control the water circulation rate so that the required temperature is maintained. Another thermostat that is familiar to you is the one at home that you use to control the temperature in the house. It probably uses a bimetallic strip to make or break an electric connection. 
The bimetallic thermometer is another device for measuring temperature. From the outside, it would look like this temperature dial attached to a long tubular stem. However, if you looked inside a typical bimetallic thermometer, you would find a helix of two different metals attached to the tube. This helix is a bimetallic strip coiled tightly around the shaft. The difference in expansion rates for the two metals causes a twisting of the shaft and a movement of the pointer on the indicating temperature dial. A somewhat different type of temperature sensing device is the bulb thermometer. This system consists of a bulb filled with liquid, a capillary tube, a pressure sensing device such as a Borden tube or a bellows, necessary linkage, a pointer, and a temperature scale. In a liquid-filled system, the expansion of the liquid, when heated, increases the pressure inside the bulb, capillary tube, and Borden tube, causing it to try to straighten out, just as it does in measuring pressure. Now open your workbook to exercise number four. Suppose we now look at level sensing devices. The gauge glass is the simplest device for measuring the liquid level in a vessel. With the valves at the top and bottom of the glass open, the level in the gauge glass mounted outside of the vessel will be the same as the level inside the drum. This permits an easy visual check on the liquid level. When using a gauge glass for level, be sure that both top and bottom openings into the gauge glass are open. The most commonly used device for indicating level inside process vessels is the displacer. The displacer is a long, narrow metal cylinder that is heavier than the liquid in which it is immersed. It operates on the principle of losing weight in proportion to weight of the volume of liquid displaced. Let's illustrate. Here is a displacer supported by a spring scale. The displacer is placed in an empty cylindrical vessel. You can see that the displacer weighs three pounds. We poured water into the cylinder and brought the water level to seven inches. As the water level rose, there was a loss of displacer weight. With seven inches of water present, the spring scale shows the displacer weight to be two pounds. This loss in weight of one pound by the displacer represents one pound of water displaced. As more water was added, more of the displacer was immersed, and the displacer continued to lose weight. At a water level of 14 inches, the displacer weight dropped to one pound. The more the displacer is submerged, the greater is the upward thrust created by the buoyancy of the displacer. Now suppose that instead of a spring balance, the displacer was connected to a beam with a pin, and the beam was supported on a knife edge or fulcrum. An indicating gauge with a pointer was also connected to the beam, along with a small metal tube clamped at the end. You can see that the upward force exerted by the buoyancy of the displacer is converted to a twisting motion, or torque, on the metal tube. Since this twisting movement is applied to the small tube, the tube is referred to as a torque tube. You recall that when the cylinder was empty, the spring scale showed a displacer weight of three pounds. And when the cylinder was half full, or had seven inches of water, the spring scale showed a displacer weight of two pounds. And when full, or containing fourteen inches of water, the scale showed a displacer weight of one pound. So for every change in liquid level, there is a corresponding change in the displacer weight of the spring scale until the displacer is totally submerged in the liquid. After the displacer is totally submerged, there is no further change in weight. Here you can see some liquid levels 
and the corresponding displacer weights. When the spring balance was replaced with the beam and torque tube arrangement, the displacer weight is converted to a twist or torque as indicated by the pointer. The pointer reading will vary with change in liquid level. Instead of reading in pounds, the scale could be changed to read in feet or inches of liquid level. Or you might use a displacer and torque tube arrangement like this. As the liquid level moves up or down, there is a slight vertical motion of the displacer. Since the movement of the displacer is so small, the rotation caused by the movement of the torque arm is absorbed by twisting of the torque tube. If the free end of the torque tube were connected with the required linkage, a pointer and scale, changes in liquid level could be read in any units desired. The displacer is widely used in measuring liquid levels. The maximum torque is exerted by the displacer when the liquid level is zero. The minimum torque occurs when the displacer is totally submerged in liquid. Since once the displacer is totally submerged, there is no further change in torque. Thus, the length of the displacer determines the range of level which may be measured. A comparatively simple device for measuring and controlling liquid level is the ball float. The ball can be installed inside the vessel itself, or it can be installed in an external chamber. The liquid level in a vessel open to the atmosphere can be determined using a pressure gauge installed at the bottom of the vessel. You learn this in the module on pressure. You recall we said that a column of water, one foot in height, would exert a pressure of 0 0.433 pounds per square inch. And you calculated feet of liquid head by dividing the pressure in pounds per square inch by 0 0.433 times the specific gravity. Being able to make this conversion makes it relatively easy to determine the liquid level in a vessel from a pressure gauge reading at the bottom of the vessel. Suppose, for example, a vessel containing water was open to the atmosphere. A pressure gauge at the bottom of the vessel reads 8.66 pounds per square inch. Since it is open to the atmosphere, the gauge at the top of the vessel reads 0 pounds per square inch. So the bottom pressure of 8.66 pounds per square inch is due only to the height of water in the vessel. When we substitute in the equation the pressure gauge reading of 8.66 pounds per square inch pressure and the specific gravity of water, which is 1, we find the height of water in the vessel to be 20 feet. The difference in the top and bottom pressure is 8.66 pounds per square inch, and this is the pressure generated by a column of water 20 feet in height. Now let's look at a vessel in which there is a static pressure above the liquid level. You recall in the previous example we used the differential pressure between top and bottom gauges to determine the height of water in the vessel. In this example, the top gauge reads 2.0 pounds per square inch, and the bottom gauge reads 10.1 pounds per square inch. What is the differential pressure? It is 10.1 minus 2.0, or 8.1 pounds per square inch. We would substitute 8.1 for the pressure of the height of the water and find that the liquid height is 18.7 feet of water. Another means of measuring level is with a differential pressure instrument. The DP cell is a common means of measuring level on operating units where vessels are operating under pressure. One tap is connected to the bottom of the vessel and the other to the vapor space. The differential pressure is proportional only to the height of the liquid and its specific gravity. While the differential pressure instrument is a common means of measuring levels on operating units, 
It is also used in some tank field installations. The system may differ in appearance, but the principle is the same. The differential pressure can be easily converted into feet of liquid level when the specific gravity of the liquid is known. The simplest form of measuring level in field tanks is the bob gauge. With this installation, a large flat float rides the surface of the liquid. A cable connected to the float runs over a pulley at the top of the tank to an indicator on the outside of the tank. The indicator rises or falls with the tank level. An improvement on the bob gauge is a float counterbalanced by a spring or a motor. The cable is replaced with a measuring tape that is enclosed in conduit and is vapor tight. The tape can be read at ground level or the level reading can be transmitted to a control room or control center. The Varick installation is a gauging device of this sort. Now open your workbook to exercise number five.